Today, we'll explore 10 unique JavaScript interview questions that might be new to you. They'll challenge your problem-solving skills and knowledge of JavaScript's quirks. We'll cover each one with thorough answers and insights, so don't miss out. Let's start with our first question. How would you use a closure inside a for loop to ensure the correct value is logged every time? Let's break down the concept of closures and loops in JavaScript, step by step, to understand a common issue and how to solve it. We start with a for loop. The job of this loop is to run several times, in our example, it'll run from 0 to 4. In every iteration, the loop increments the value of i by 1. Simple enough, right? Inside the body of this loop, we introduce set timeout. This function allows us to delay actions. Set timeout takes two parameters. The first is a function to execute after a delay. The second is the delay itself, in milliseconds. In this case, the delay is i1000, which means we want to log the value of i after i seconds. Now, when we use set timeout within our loop, a closure is formed. A closure means that the inner function retains access to the outer function's variables. Here, the inner function is the callback for set timeout, and the outer function is our loop. You might guess that this setup logs numbers 0 through 4, each after a set number of seconds. But here's the twist, because var is function scoped, it ends up with a single binding. By the time the set timeout functions start executing, our loop has finished, and i is left at 5. That's why it logs 5 repeatedly. To fix this, we use what's called an IIFE, or immediately invoked function expression. An IIFE is a function that runs immediately as it's defined. Here, we pass the current value of i into our IIFE, which creates a new scope for each iteration. The set timeout callback now has the correct value of i for each loop iteration. At first glance, this might look a bit complex, but don't worry, we'll break it down together. Let's see how an IIFE helps with the first iteration, where i is 0. As the loop starts, i is 0. The IIFE is immediately invoked with i as its argument, which is now named current value inside the IIFE. The set timeout is set up to log this current value after current value seconds, in this case, after 0 seconds. Moving on to the second iteration, i is now 1. The loop increments i to 1. Another IIFE is invoked, again capturing the current i, which is 1, and setting a set timeout to log 1 after 1 second. This pattern continues for each iteration. Each time the loop runs, the current value of i is passed to a new IIFE, creating a unique scope for that value. So the set timeout inside each IIFE is closed over a different current value. To recap, even though var i itself is function scoped and would end up being 5 for all set timeout calls if used directly, the IIFE captures the current value of i at each loop iteration and passes it as current value. This gives each set timeout its own separate scope with its own current value. This way, each set timeout can correctly log the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. At Another, and perhaps more modern solution, is to use let instead of var. The let keyword does have block scope, and it will ensure each iteration of the loop has its own i. With this let version, we get the same correct behavior as with the IIFE. And that covers our first question on closures inside loops. Now, let's move on to our next challenge. Next, let's talk about object observers. How can you detect changes to properties on an object? In JavaScript, objects are a collection of properties, and sometimes, we want to perform some action when a property changes. Detecting changes directly on an object isn't straightforward since JavaScript objects don't notify us when their properties change. So, what's the problem? Let's say we have an object like this. We want to know when the age property changes. How can we accomplish this? Let's explore some solutions step by step. One common approach is using setters and getters. We can convert our object properties into accessor properties that control how values are set and retrieved. With this setup, any assignment to user.age will trigger the setter function, which logs a message to the console. The underscore is a naming convention indicating that underscore age should not be accessed directly. But what if we have many properties or need more control? Enter JavaScript proxy. A proxy can wrap our object and intercept operations like property assignment. Now, if we make changes using user proxy, our proxy intercepts the change and logs the message. To sum up, we've explored two powerful ways to detect property changes in an object, using setters and getters for simple scenarios or JavaScript proxies for more complex situations. Question 3. Arrays can be tricky, especially nested ones. How would you flatten a deeply nested array in JavaScript? Suppose we have a nested array, like this one. 
Our goal is to flatten this array so that all the nested elements are in a single array, with no nesting. In other words, we want to turn it into this, how do we do that in JavaScript? Let's explore our options. First up, we've got the dot flat method introduced in ES 2019. This method creates a new array with all subarray elements concatenated into it recursively up to the specified depth. By passing infinity, we're telling dot flat to go as deep as necessary to flatten the entire structure. And just like that we have our flattened array. Elegant, isn't it? Moving on to question 4. Can you give an example of prototypal inheritance in JavaScript? Prototypal inheritance can be a bit of a head-scratcher. In classical inheritance, as seen in languages like Java or c -sharp, objects are instances of classes, and a class can inherit from another class. JavaScript, however, doesn't use classes, well, not until ES6, and even then, it's syntactic sugar over prototypal inheritance. Instead, objects inherit directly from other objects. So, here's the challenge, suppose we have an object animal and we want to create another object dog that inherits from it. How do we achieve this? The most straightforward way in modern JavaScript is to use object, create. This method creates a new object, using an existing object as the prototype of the newly created object. Now, dog can bark, and it also has the isAlive property inherited from animal. With object.create, prototypal inheritance is a breeze. Before object.create was introduced, the common way to set up inheritance was with constructor functions. Here, dog.prototype is an object created from animal.prototype, so dog instances inherit from animal. Also, we ensure that the dog prototype's constructor points back to dog. It's a bit more verbose, but it gives you a good understanding of how JavaScript used to handle prototypal inheritance. And finally, with ES6, JavaScript introduced class syntax. Now, I know I said JavaScript doesn't use classes, and it's true, this is just syntactic sugar over the prototypal pattern we've been discussing. Now we can create a dog object like this. And there you have it, dog inherits from animal, and we can use the methods defined in both. It's neat, modern, and feels like the class-based OOP you'd find in other languages. Remember, while ES6 classes might be the most familiar form for those coming from other languages, it's still prototypal inheritance under the hood. Always choose the right tool for the job. Our fifth question, how does the this keyword work, and what will it refer to in different contexts? First, let's look at the global context. When we use this outside any function, it refers to the global object. In browsers, that's the window object. Here, this equals window because we are in the global execution context. Now, what happens inside a regular function? If we're not in strict mode, this still points to the global object. If we activate strict mode with use strict, this will be undefined. Constructors are special functions that create instances. When we use new, this inside the constructor refers to the new instance. Our instance of my constructor has a property a with the value value. Let's take a look at how this behaves inside both a regular method and an arrow method of an object. Consider the following example, in my regular method, which is a regular function, this refers to the object my object because regular functions have a dynamic this context, which means this is determined by how the function is called. When you call my regular method as a method of my object, this is bound to my object, hence the console log returns true. On the other hand, my arrow method is an arrow function. Arrow functions do not have their own this context, instead they capture this from the surrounding lexical scope at the time they are created. In this case, the arrow function is created at the global scope. Which means this inside my arrow method refers to the global object, or undefined if in strict mode, not my object. As a result, when we compare this to my object in my arrow method, it returns false because this is not bound to my object, but to the global context or undefined. Our sixth question is about a fundamental yet often misunderstood concept in JavaScript, hoisting. So, what exactly is hoisting? In JavaScript, hoisting refers to the behavior where variable and function declarations are moved to the top of their containing scope during the compilation phase. This means that regardless of where functions and variables are declared, they are moved to the top of their scope by the JavaScript interpreter. Let's break this down with an example. In this snippet, you might expect the first console.log to throw a reference error since it appears we're trying to access my var before declaring it. 
However, due to hoisting, what the JavaScript engine actually does is something like this, the declaration, var my var, is hoisted to the top of its scope, which is the global scope in this case. Note that only the declaration is hoisted, not the initialization. When we try to console.log, my var, the first time, my var is declared but not defined, so it returns undefined. After my var is assigned the value of 5, logging it to the console shows the value correctly. Hoisting also applies to function declarations, allowing you to call functions before they appear in the code. In the case of functions, both the declaration and the definition are hoisted, so the function can be called before its declaration in the code. However, hoisting works differently with function expressions, especially when using the let and const keywords which are block scoped and not hoisted in the same way, in this case. My func is not hoisted because it's a function expression assigned to a const variable. If you try to execute my func before its declaration, you will get a type error. Our seventh question is all about equality in JavaScript, and we're going to tackle a topic that's vital for every JavaScript developer to understand the difference between double equals to and triple equals to. Let's start with the double equals operator. The double equals operator checks for equality after performing any necessary type conversions. Here are a few examples to help illustrate this. In the first comparison, console.log, 1 equals equals 1, JavaScript is comparing a number with a string. The double equals operator converts the string 1 to a numeric 1, and since both values are now the same, the comparison returns true. In the second comparison, console.log, 0 equals equals false. The number 0 is being compared to the boolean false. JavaScript converts false to 0, and since 0 equals 0, the result is true. In the third comparison, console.log, null equals equals undefined, null and undefined are being compared. These two values are considered equal by the double equals operator, which is a special rule of JavaScript, so it also returns true. Now, let's move on to the triple equals operator. The triple equals operator checks for both type and value equality, without converting the operands. This means if the values aren't of the same type, the comparison will always be false. Here are the same examples using triple equals, in the first strict comparison, console, log, 1 equals 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 1, the number 1 and the string 1 are of different types, so the comparison returns false, regardless of the value. In the second example, console.log, 0 equals 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 false, even though 0 is falsy and false is, well, false, they are not the same type. One is a number and the other is a boolean, so the triple equals operator returns false. And in the third example, console.log, null equals 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 undefined, while null and undefined can seem similar, they are different types. The triple equals operator returns false as it does not consider them the same. Our eighth question in the JavaScript series, what are template literals in JavaScript? Template literals, a feature introduced with ES6, have completely changed the game for string manipulation in JavaScript. They allow us to create strings with embedded expressions, which we can use for things like building URLs, creating HTML templates, and so much more. Let's get hands-on and see this in action. Imagine you're coding up a personal greeting. In the old days, you might have concatenated strings and variables like this. But now, with template literals, you can simplify your syntax. You use backticks, not quotes, to encapsulate your string, and you can insert variables right inside the string with the dollar syntax. Let's rewrite our greeting. Look at that, no more plus signs, no more escaping quotes. Just a clean, readable line of code. And the best part? Template literals support multi-line strings without any special characters. Let me show you. As you can see, template literals are a powerful addition to JavaScript. They make your code more readable and flexible. Whether you're new to coding or a seasoned pro, using template literals will undoubtedly improve your JavaScript experience. Question number nine is a big one, especially if you're diving deeper into the functional aspects of the language. What are higher order functions in programming, particularly in functional programming? A higher order function is a function that does at least one of the following. It can take other functions as arguments or it returns a function as its result. This concept allows for a great deal of flexibility and reuse in code. Let's start with a classic example, a higher order function that takes another function as an argument. One of the most familiar ones you'll encounter in JavaScript is the array.prototype.map function. Let's see it in action. In this example, map is a higher order function because it takes another function as its argument and applies it to every element in the array. Just like these nesting dolls, higher order functions contain other functions either as input or output. Now, let's take a look at a higher order function that returns a function. In this scenario, greater than is a higher order function because it returns a new function that checks if a number is greater than n. That's the power of higher order functions. They can lead to more expressive and concise code, 
and they're all over the place in JavaScript. Whether it's in array methods like map and filter, or in your own custom functions, higher order functions will help you write code that's both elegant and efficient. Our last question for today is a fundamental concept that every developer should be crystal clear about. What is the difference between mutable and immutable objects in JavaScript? In programming, mutable refers to objects whose state can be modified after they're created. Conversely, immutable objects are those that, once created, their state cannot be changed. Let's illustrate with an example. In JavaScript, objects and arrays are mutable by default. This means you can change their properties or elements at any time. Now, on the immutable side, once you create a string or a number, you can't alter it. You can only create a new string or number. Let's see what that looks like. When you attempt to modify an immutable object, what actually happens is that a new object is created with the new value. The original object remains untouched. This is a powerful feature of functional programming, which JavaScript supports. Understanding this difference is crucial when passing objects to functions. If you pass a mutable object, such as an array or an object, the function can make changes to it, and those changes will be reflected outside the function. With an immutable object, like a number or string, the function can't change the original value, only return a new one based on it, and that wraps up our discussion on mutable and immutable objects. Thank you for watching, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share.